hi welcome back to my channel i hope you all are well thank you for clicking on this video today we are going to be talking about the true crime case of myra rosales and the death of lseo jr before i get started i wanted to remind you that i make true crime and commentary content so if that's something you enjoy please consider liking and subscribing let's get into it just wanted to uh, place a trigger warning before i begin this video this case involves mentions of disordered eating specifically binge eating disorder and child abuse though i will not go into elaborate explanations of the abuse abuse or of the disorder, but if you feel like that's something you can't handle right now, please take care of yourself and click off this video. My 600 Pound Life is a reality television show that started airing in 2012 and was produced or put on TLC, which follows individuals who weigh over 600 pounds and it follows them over a year time on their journey to lose weight or deal with their disordered eating. Many individuals who are featured on the show suffer from a variety of physical and mental health issues that contribute to their extreme weight gain and their relationship with food. One illness that these individuals commonly suffer with is binge eating disorder. Binge eating disorder is an eating disorder and is defined as, quote, a severe life-threatening and treatable eating disorder characterized by recurrent episodes of eating large quantities of food, often very quickly and to the point of discomfort, a feeling of loss of control during the binge, experiencing shame, distress, or guilt after the binge, and not regularly using unhealthy compensate compensatory measures, so purging to counter the binge. Binge eating disorder is, of course, a very serious disorder, but it can become manageable for the person suffering through medical or psychological intervention. I will put more information below about this disorder and a few resources that you can check out if you yourself or su are suffering or someone you know is suffering. But for today, I will be specifically focusing on the case of Myra Rosales. Myra was the focus of a 2012 TLC documentary that's sort of related to My 600 Pound Life called Half Ton Killer. The documentary followed Myra around for four years from 2008 to 2012 and it followed her health journey and the murder trial she was undergoing for allegedly murdering her two-year-old nephew. There was also a follow-up documentary that aired on a TLC a couple years later called Half Ton Killer Transformed, but for the life of me, I couldn't find its existence anywhere online, so I have no idea what goes on or if there's more information about the case in that one. For a very famous case, there is little to no public information about Myra Rosales, her childhood, or her family, but I will do my best to try to piece together the pieces that I did find online to make a coherent timeline and story for you guys. A lot of the information I sort of pieced or squished together from various public Facebook posts that Myra has posted herself. Myra Elizabeth Rosales was born on November 6, 1980 in Texas to parents Anna Joya or Hoya Joya Cortez and Rosendo Rosales Leon. So sorry if I'm butchering names. I always do. It is unclear how many siblings Myra has, but she has at least one sibling that is known publicly and who is relevant to this case, a sister named Jamie Lee Rosales. I do believe that the pair have other siblings, but regardless, Myra was the first born to her parents. As I said, little is known about Myra's childhood and family, so it's unclear how exactly she was raised. However, in the TLC documentary about Myra, she does briefly talk about her childhood, so that's the sort of information I have. Myra said that as the firstborn daughter to her parents, she was her father's favorite, so she was sort of like daddy's little girl, and by all accounts, Myra really did 
start off having a very good relationship with her father, but this all took a turn when Myra said she witnessed her she actually physically witnessed her father having an affair. It is unclear if Myra's parents were ever married or if they were just in a monogamous relationship when she witnessed this affair, but nonetheless, this really traumatized Myra and impacted her growth in childhood. She said that after she witnessed this and the other consequences that her father's affair had on her family, she Myra started eating more and more to cope with her feelings and she started gaining weight really fast. Prior to this, Myra says that she was a pretty active child and she was pretty healthy as a young kid. According to Myra's public Facebook page, she went to La Jolla High School, obviously located in La Jolla, Texas, and graduated in 1998. After high school, Myra attended South Texas College, which is a local community college, and she studied criminal justice there. I'm not super familiar with the entire American post-secondary education system, as I am a Canadian, but from my understanding, the criminal justice program is an associate's degree, which is I believe a two-year degree that you can get. I'm unsure if Myra ever finished the program, but either way, she stopped attending a South Texas College in 2000. After this, Myra attended San Antonio College of Medical in and dentist assistance in 2003 to gain her certification to be a medical office specialist. My understanding of a medical office specialist is just the sort of admin person at a clinic or a hospital. And then Myra graduated and received her certificate in 2004. Seemingly early in her adulthood, Myra married an unknown man who she has referred to a few times in different Facebook posts. She said that she filed for divorce from this man shortly before he got involved in illegal activities in the Mexican or with the Mexican drug cartels. According to Myra's Facebook, her first husband is allegedly missing and has been for a very long time because of his involvement with, quote, the wrong people. After her first failed marriage, Myra married a man named Bernie sometime in her early 20s, I believe, and he is featured prominently in the TLC documentary on Myra. In her early 20s, Myra really started to struggle with her weight, and by the time she was only 23, she had limited mobility because of her extreme weight gain. Before long, Myra was actually bedridden and remained remained that way for five or six years. At her highest weight, Myra weighed around 1,036 pounds. It has been reported that Myra suffered from a rare thyroid disease. I'll put the name of the disease on the screen. I can't pronounce it, so I'll just put it. And then her having this disease contributed to her extreme weight gain. Essentially, her body couldn't produce enough of the thyroid hormone, which impacted the functions of all or almost all of her organs which caused them not to uh, function properly and extreme body swelling. This condition can be fatal because of the poor organ functioning. The person can go into a coma and die. In the TLC documentary, Jamie, which is Myra's younger sister, recalls how her and Myra were really close to each other during their childhood and how they spent basically all their time together. The close sisters started living together in adult Adulthood, though it's unclear which year they moved in together, but by 2008, the sisters were living together in La Jolla, Texas, along with Myra's husband, Bernie, and Jamie's four young kids. I believe Jamie's husband, a man named Elisio Sr., was also living with them at the time. As I said, Jamie had four young children, three boys and one son at a very young age, and it was clear that she was really 
really struggling with motherhood. In fact, Child Protective Services or CPS got involved with Jamie and her four children relatively early on in their lives. It is unclear when the first sort of visit from CPS to Jamie was, but I found it reported that CPS had visited the household on at least three different occasions to follow up on reports of abuse. On one occasion, CPS came over to Jamie's household after there had been reports that Jamie was abusing one of her daughters. Allegedly, at this visit, CPS confirmed that there was abuse happening in the household, but there seemed to be nothing done. The children weren't removed from the household. They continued to live with Jamie. Regardless, I'm sure CPS had some sort of agreement in place or some sort of something in place with Jamie after they confirmed the abuse in the household. After the initial report, CPS received two more reports of abuse against Jamie and they sent CPS workers, of course, out to Jamie's home to investigate the claims. On these two investigations, the workers said that they couldn't determine whether or not abuse was happening in the home. Myra said that Jamie would often go out and when she did go out, she would leave her four children in the care of Myra, even though Myra was bedbound at the time. CPS then found out that Jamie was leaving her four young kids under the care of Myra, who obviously at that point in her life didn't have the physical capacity to look after these kids. In response, CPS made Jamie sign a safety plan in April 2007 that prohibited Jamie from leaving her children in Myra's care because of her physical limitations. A safety plan is, quote, a written agreement between CPS and the family, which serves as a short-term solution to address specific concerns about child safety in a home. Despite the safety plan and a CPS intervention, Jamie continued to leave her four young children at home with Myra when she went out. On the morning of March 18th, 2008, Myra reported that Jamie left the house, leaving Myra to take care of Jamie's three youngest children. Um, reportedly, Jamie had taken her eldest child out with with her. One of the children that was left under the care of Myra that day was Eliseo Jr. Eliseo Gonzalez Jr. Rosales was born on September 9th, 2005, so at the time he was around two and a half years old. Myra's original story of what went down that day went something like this. After Jamie and her eldest left the house, Myra was, of course, watching Jamie's three youngest children. She was in her room, seated on the king mattress, of course, because she was bedridden and never got out of the bed. And then Eliseo Jr. entered the room and he was sitting on a chair in like a corner of the room and he fell off the chair. So Myra went over to him to sort of pick him up. But when she got to the edge of the bed, she sort of reached out to another piece of furniture in the room to steady her as she tried to reach down and picked Eliseo up, she lost her balance and collapsed or fell onto Eliseo. She said that she landed on his head. Keep in mind that at the time she weighed between 800 and 1,000 pounds. It appears that Eliseo didn't immediately go unconscious from the injuries he sustained after his aunt allegedly fell on top of him, but less than two hours later, Myra said she started hearing or she noticed that Eliseo was having trouble breathing and that his head had swollen. So she allegedly phoned Jamie and told her that Eliseo had gotten it stuck under the bed or gotten his head stuck under the bed and that's what caused the injury. Eliseo's condition was of course worsening so Myra called 911 or dialed 911 to get him medical treatment 
and Alessio was immediately rushed to Rio Grande Regional Hospital. Sadly, by the time Alessio arrived at the hospital, he was in a coma and was admitted to the hospital's intensive care unit. Tragically, Alessio succumbed to his injuries and was pronounced dead two days later after he was removed from life support on the afternoon of March 20th, 2008. By the time that Alessio had passed away, authorities were already investigating his injuries because the story around it was unbelievable and very suspicious. Myra told authorities her version of events, which is essentially that she slipped and fell on top of Alessio's head, but the authorities weren't believing her. After his death, of course, an autopsy was performed on Eliseo and it found that his injuries weren't consistent with his head being crushed under Myra's weight. The autopsy actually found that Eliseo's cause of death was blunt force trauma and it deemed the event a homicide and not an accident. There were two separate fractures to Eliseo's skull, which would have had to be created by being hit by a small object repeatedly on his skull. He also had a hematoma hemorrhage on his scalp, which in my layman understanding is just internal bleeding between his head and his skull, which was what caused the bump on top of his head. The coroner also found evidence that Alessio had suffered previous head trauma, which were bruises and skull fractures. The coroner stated that these fractures to his skull had taken place a month prior, meaning he had been physically assaulted a month or abused a month prior to his death. Based on the autopsies, authorities believed that Myra had lied about her telling of events. They theorized that she had been abusing Eliseo and that on that day she had intentionally struck him repeatedly in the head with an object which caused him to pass. They believed that she tried to cover up for the abuse by just making up this story Story that she had fallen on top of him. Myra was then arrested in late March 2000 in her home for the death of Alessio Jr. She was charged with capital murder and was facing the death penalty if she was convicted. She was actually photographed and fingerprinted in sort of booked in her own home because of her extreme weight and her immobility problems. She couldn't actually be transported to a jail or she couldn't be held in a jail cell. Local jails could only accommodate inmates weighing up to 500 pounds, so she was released on her to her home on her own recognizance. Recog- recog- recognance. I think that's it. <laughs> Jamie Lee Rosales was also arrested and charged with injury to a child because she had left Eliseo Jr. in the care of Myra after being told by CPS that she wasn't allowed to do that. She was held at a local jail and had a $50,000 bail. At this time, Myra was 27 years old and Jamie was only 20. Awaiting her trial, Myra was placed on house arrest she wasn't a flight risk due to her immobility and she received a court appointed defense lawyer which is a man named Sergio Valdez. On August 21st 2008 Myra was indicted by a grand jury on charges of one count of first degree murder and one count of injury to a child. She was still facing the death penalty if convicted at trial. At this point Myra's bond was raised to 100 hundred and fifty thousand dollars and she remained on house arrest because she still couldn't be accommodated in any of the local jails due to her weight and local authorities feared that they didn't have the medical treatment available for Myra and that if they did jail her that she would die. 
Jamie's charges remained the same around this time, so she was still facing injury to a child, and her bond was increased to $100,000. The terms of her arrest also prohibited Maya from having any contact with children under the age of 17. The trial proceedings took a really long time to start because of the logistics of Myra and her size and condition. Authorities in her county couldn't find a court or a courtroom that could accommodate her needs and size. Her defense lawyer, Sergio, and the other lawyers on the case, such as the prosecuting team, were trying to find or were working to find a courthouse in the county or the district that could accommodate everyone's needs. At one point, they were even considering just having Myra, like, put her where the audience was, seated on a king-size mattress, and she would live in the courtroom for the duration of her trial, which could last for a few months. Meanwhile, Myra's defense lawyer, Sergio, was trying to compile a good defense that would spare Myra from receiving the death penalty. His main defense was proving that due to Myra's extremely limited mobility, she wouldn't have been able to physically strike Alessio Jr. with the force that was needed to cause his death. As part of her defense, Sergio videotaped Myra in her bed to approve that her condition was so bad that she couldn't really move around on her own and that she couldn't lift her arm or swing it high enough to actually cause the fracture to Eliseo's skull. Additionally, there was a lot of concerns from those involved in the trial, including Myra's defense lawyer and and the state judge who was set to try the case, there were concerns that this case would sort of become a circus or a freak show because of its sheer, like, absurdity. Sergio was really fearful that the public would immediately villainize Myra solely based on her condition and her size. He continued to do his best to construct a good defense for Myra, but he said he Throughout this whole case, he always believed that Myra hadn't done this and was just covering up for someone. Finally, in late 2009, over a year after Myra's initial arrest, Myra told Sergio the truth about what happened. So he visited her home to record or videotape her confession. So this is how the real events of March 18th, 2008 actually happened. Just putting another trigger warning, now because I'm going to go more into abuse allegations and LSEO's abuse. I won't be going into extreme detail, just enough so you know the facts of the case. Myra told Sergio that Jamie had a history of abusing her children, especially Eliseo Jr. She said that whenever Eliseo cried, Jamie would start yelling at him in an attempt to get him to stop. Keep in mind that Eliseo was a literal baby at the time, and it's very normal for babies to cry as a bid for a attention or affection. Eventually, the verbal abuse became physical, so now whenever Eliseo Jr. cried, Jamie would hit or kick him in an attempt to get him to stop. Then, in the early morning of March 18th, 2008, Jamie was trying to get Eliseo Jr. to eat his breakfast, but he was crying and refusing to eat it. Myra said that she told her sister just to like wait till Elcio calmed down to sort of feed his breakfast because if he was crying, he was not going to eat. But nonetheless, Jamie became frustrated with Elcio and repeatedly hit Elcio in the arms, legs, and head with a red plastic hairbrush. Myra also said she remembers that a bump began to form on Eliseo's head shortly after the assault. After the assault, Jamie wrapped Eliseo up in a Winnie the Pooh blanket and put him to bed. She then left the house, leaving Myra in charge of her three youngest children. Around a couple hours later, Myra said she started noticing that Eliseo 
Alessio was having trouble breathing, so she immediately called Jamie over and over again to try to get help from her sister, I guess. Um, then she eventually called emergency services. As we already know, Alessio was rushed to the hospital and admitted to the ICU, um, and sadly, passed away from his injuries two days later. But now there are reports that when Alessio was still in the hospital, Jamie actually called Myra begging her to take the blame for what happened to Alessio. Jamie asked her sister to confess to the police that what happened was her fault and Myra did. Myra said she took the blame because she knew she was already dying because of her condition and her failing health, and she didn't want the rest of Jamie's children to be taken away from them by the state. Myra said that she was revealing the truth now because Jamie had gotten pregnant with her fifth child, and Myra was afraid that this would happen again and the cycle of abuse would continue. I also saw it reported that Jamie continued to abuse her other three children even after Alessio Jr.'s death. Based on her new confession, Sergio and Myra teamed up to secretly record um, a conversation between Myra and, Dream and Jamie to try to get Jamie to implicate herself in Alessio Jr.'s death. In the taped recording, Jamie doesn't really actually admit to doing it, but she also doesn't deny that she did it when Myra says that she did. Seemingly, after hearing that Myra had implicated her in Alessio's death, Jamie and her husband, Alessio Sr., fled to Mexico to evade arrest. The couple remained in Mexico for months until Jamie was eventually con convinced to return to America where she could be arraigned and arrested. In the TLC documentary, her return to the States is actually filmed and Jamie states that she returned to America because of Alessio Sr.'s treatment of her in Mexico. There were a lot of allegations that Alessio Sr. was involved in a Mexican a drug cartel. Uh, Jamie alleges that after they fled to Mexico, Alessio Sr. started trafficking her, so basically selling her to men for sex, and she felt that she would be safer if she turned herself into a prison in America than it continued continuing to live with Alessio Sr. in Mexico. After returning to Texas, Jamie was indicted on four counts, including capital murder and two counts of injury to a child on May 13th, 2010. She was, I believe, 22 now. Her arraignment was postponed twice, once due to some sort of typo and another due to allegations that she was healing from a leg injury that Alessio Sr. had caused her. She was eventually arraigned by the end of May 2010. Despite her sister being implicated and charged in Alessio's death, Myra's charges weren't immediately dropped. So for a while, both Myra and Jamie were essentially being charged for the same thing. They were being charged for actually causing Alessio's death, even though it was only one person that did it. They were going to try both of them, and Jamie was set to be tried first. In regards to Jamie, she never went to trial. She took a plea deal, which required her to plead guilty to the lesser charge of injury to a child, and she was sentenced to 15 years in a prison and is set to be released in 2025, though she could have been paroled after only a few years in jail. After successfully proving her innocence in relation to Alessio Jr.'s death, she was acquitted for, or Myra was acquitted for her capital murder charges in January 2012. To my knowledge, no other charges was were pursued in relation to Myra's involvement in Alessio's death, so like no conspiracy to commit murder charges or neglect or injury to a child. 
There was no charges about her giving a false confession or not reporting the abuse that she obviously viewed. Since she was no longer facing legal charges, Myra was finally able to receive medical treatment for her physical condition. It was actually said that Myra was able to receive or connect with people or doctors who specialized in treatment of her condition because her hate, her case was so widely publicized. After receiving around 11 different surgeries, including gastric bypass, Myra was able to lose 800 pounds in only a couple of years. Obviously, Myra's progress was heavily monitored as extreme weight loss can be very dangerous to one's health and you need to be monitored in a medical setting in these like scenarios. Myra said that after losing all the weight, she was in perfect health. Um, All her organs were working as they should, and she wasn't suffering from high blood pressure or diabetes. Sometime in 2013, Myra actually filed for divorce against Bernie, her second husband. This came as a huge shock to a lot of the public who followed Myra's case because in the TLC documentary, Bernie is portrayed as as this doting, loving husband. He literally was her full-time caregiver when she was bedridden. He would feed her. He would wash her. He would, when she went to the bathroom, he would clean that up, etc., etc. Initially, Myra said that she and Bernie had filed for divorce because he wanted to move back to be with his family in Mexico, and she wanted to stay in America. But a little bit later, Myra would go on to published more serious accusations about Bernie on her very on her various Facebook accounts. Myra alleged that while she was in the hospital in Houston during her extreme weight loss progress, Bernie had allegedly gotten involved with a drug cartel. She also recently added on to the accusations in 2020. Um, She publicly commented that she had found out that Bernie had allegedly molested a niece. Um, I'm unsure if which side of the family this niece is on. In 2016, she married a new man, her third now third husband, who she remains married to to this day. Um, this man is named DJ Carlos De La Rosa, and she took his last name. DJ is the first husband of Myra's that she actually changed her last name for. As for Jamie's children, after Jamie went to jail for causing Alessio Jr.'s death, um, Myra and Jamie's mother actually took custody of the remaining four kids. In one letter, Myra said she visits and looks after Jamie's children often. She says that they were her main motivation for staying alive and losing all the weight. Jamie and Myra still keep in contact while Jamie's in prison through writing letters to each other. In one letter, Myra said that Jamie asked for Myra's forgiveness and said that if their mother passed away, that she wanted Myra to take custody of her children. Myra says that she forgives Jamie for killing Eliseo Jr. because Myra feels that Jamie is finally taking accountability for her actions and now understands that what she did was wrong. I did forgive her. I I don't have nothing against her. And uh, maybe wait, Myra, you you don't have seem, Myra. I, maybe I, I, seem l- wrong. Yeah, I mean, you're saying you don't have anything against I her. She her. killed your nephew. Yes, but she's still my sister, and I love her. And I, I think I, I what I what I when I read, she's really she's really uh, taking responsibility of her actions and. Uh, She's getting the help she needs. So that's it for the case of Myra Rosales and the death of Eliseo Jr. Um, Please let me know what you think about the case below. 
I'm unsure about my own feelings of this case, to be honest. I do believe that there is a possibility that LFCO Jr. could have been alive if Myra had called emergency services earlier that day or if she had reported the abuse sooner or validated the abuse sooner. Myra did witness her sister repeatedly abuse her children and to my understanding, Myra never stepped in to sort of prevent this. On the other hand, Myra did suffer from an extreme physical illness which could have impacted her ability to get involved and to help. I, I'm not sure. Please let me know your thoughts below. Do you think that a justice was served? Do you think that it was fair that a Jamie is only receiving a 15-year sentence when Myra was facing the death penalty for the same charge? So, thank you for watching this video and I'll see you next time. Like and subscribe if you want.